Let's find our seats again and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, one of the great chapters of the Bible. It stands like Mount Everest, inviting us to climb it by faith, to live like those men and women who have already reached the summit long before us and who stand triumphant as that great cloud of witnesses. Men and women who are examples of the preeminent theme of this chapter, a life of faith. And it's a chapter which comes, therefore, as a great encouragement to the readers of the letter to keep going. For, as we know, on our journey so far through Hebrews, many of these Christians, especially those from Jewish backgrounds, had given up the climb. They'd gone back down the slopes to the law of Moses, to temple and sacrifice and priesthood. So the writer is urging them, don't quit. Keep looking to Jesus. He is the highest, greatest peak of truth. There is no one like him. He's the way up the mountain. He's the beginning and the end of the journey. So how then does Hebrews 11 actually describe faith life well it begins in verses 1 to 3 with definitions of faith now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see this is what the ancients were commended for of course definitions of faith abound the American hum- uh, humorist H.L. Mencken defined faith as illogical belief in the occurrence of the impossible. That's perhaps a rather clever way of saying what the schoolboy did more simply in his essay. Faith is believing what you know ain't true. That popular view of faith sees it as some giant leap into the dark, a I don't know, a psychological reflex, the human need to believe in something. Said uh, the Victorian novelist George Bernard Shaw, we've not lost faith, but we've transferred it from God to the medical profession. For doctors in the 19th century, you might want to substitute scientists in the 20th century. But who trusts them anymore? Scientists, medics, Politicians, priests, they've all gone the same way. Faith has no one left to trust. And trust is exactly a definition of Christian faith. For Christians don't just believe, we believe in someone. Faith is like an anchor tying us to the object of faith. And just as an anchor secures a ship to the ocean floor, so our faith links us securely with God. Faith is not just believing that God exists. It's about anchoring ourselves to that God. In the words of verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the King James authorized translation of the Bible at that point. It captures the original language very well. Firstly, then, faith has substance. It's the substance of things hoped for. It has content. There is an object to faith. And that object, of course, is God. The confidence of faith is not in itself, but in the object upon which it rests. Take the the pews, the chairs that you're sitting on. It's not your faith which holds you up as you sit there, it's the pew. And faith rests on God. His character revealed to us uniquely through Jesus. His word which speaks to us and invites us to believe, to respond. So firstly, faith has substance. Secondly, faith is the evidence of what we do not see. And there's a very curious idea. How can you have evidence for something that you can't see or or hasn't happened yet? But faith is defined as living proof in the present of a future reality. Something that we haven't got yet, but we know we will have. Faith is a hand that grasps the future in the present. 
And so a Christian is someone who is persuaded that the very things which are not seen are in fact real and permanent. Now, does that make faith unreasonable and irrational? No, there's substance to it. We believe in that future because of what God has done in the past. And the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is that substance. For into our world came someone who didn't fit any of our categories. He was clearly a man, but he said he was the son of God. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, yet claimed that he'd come from heaven. As a good Jew, he was a descendant of Abraham, but said, before Abraham was, I am. He said that he would be killed, but would rise again. And he did. He spoke like a prophet, but said that all the prophets pointed to him and that history was going to be fulfilled in him. He claimed that he was the hope of the world, its savior, the bringer of justice and peace. Now, faith hears God's promise that in Jesus there will be a new heaven and earth, that Jesus Christ, the king, will return. Faith hears all those things and says, yes, yes. It grasps the future now in the present. So faith is a personal response to the word of God to us in Jesus. Now, come back to the text of Hebrews 11, because there follows from verse 3, 21 repetitions of the phrase, by faith, by faith, Abel by faith Enoch, by faith Noah. But the starting point in verse 3 is, look, Genesis chapter 1. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And notice also that the author includes himself and all his readers in that statement. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Men and women of faith believe God's word about creation. Hebrews 11 verse 3 is always a relief to me because I was hopeless at physics in school. The only good thing about physics in school for me was the name of my teacher, Mr. Quick. I've forgotten all my physics, but I still remember his name, Mr. Quick. He was about 75 and was Mr. Slow, as far as I recall. But his name was so glorious. Fancy having a physics teacher called Mr. Quick. Forget all the Bunsen burners and all the experiments. I still remember Mr. Quick's name. But I never quite mastered quantum mechanics in his lessons. But you see, you don't need to be a scientific genius to... Uh, master the physics of space and time and matter. I don't need to understand the difference between a quark and a, a lepton and a gluon at that subatomic level. What I need to know is that God the Creator brought everything into being from nothing, that He gave order and shape to the cosmos. We can understand creation by faith. Now, does that mean faith is therefore unscientific or anti-intellectual? Not a bit of it. Some of the most brilliant discoveries of science have, through the centuries, been made by men and women of Christian faith. There have been outstanding Christian academics and theoretical physicists and cosmologists, past and present. You see, true science is never a threat to faith. Says the author, it is by faith we understand. For the gateway to understanding is a conviction, a persuasion that God is the creator. That nothing exists before him or without him. And when we believe that, there is a breakthrough to knowledge. That's what the writer says. Faith believes that creation was caused by God. That matter is not eternal, that in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. So, definitions of faith. And then, secondly, heroes of faith. From verses 4 
to 29. For we get this, this catalog, this list of these characters who demonstrated in their lives faith. One of my favorite places to visit in London, amongst all the other um, sightseeing um, and amazing places, is, is the National Portrait Gallery. I often will go there if I've got some time in London, where in the National Portrait Gallery, hanging on the walls are pictures of famous people who've made an impact. Hebrews 11 acts a bit like the National Portrait Gallery in London. It's God's Hall of Fame. And if you look into the Hall of Fame, Abraham is by far the largest single portrait in the gallery. So we really ought to have a look at him. His description is drawn, his painting is, 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 is there from verses 8 to 19. It begins, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And there, there follows other extracts and ep- excerpts from Abraham's life. It's a summary, you see, of the narrative recorded in the book of Genesis. The painter of Abraham's picture doesn't give every detail of his life, What he chooses to include here in Hebrews 11, therefore, is very significant, and it's deliberate. Let's look at it. Firstly, in verse 8, there's a command to obey. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. God spoke to this man, Abraham, just one man. You see, it only takes one. And you may be tonight the only one who trusts God in your family or in your school class or in the office. All this one man Abraham had was the word of God. And that word of God to him was go. But that was enough. He didn't know where he was going or how he was going to get there. There were no details given to Abraham in the story in Genesis, but he obeyed, says Martin Luther. This is the glory of faith, simply not to know. Not to know where you're going, not to know what you're doing, not to know what you must suffer, but with sense and intellect, virtue and will to follow the naked voice of God. Once true faith grips us, Things can never be the same. That's what the writer is saying about Abraham's life. God had spoken to Abraham, and that's it. He had to move. For when true faith grips us, there is no staying where we are. Faith leads to action, change, movement. Now, we may often wonder where life is taking us, to what job, to what future. None of us can settle every question in advance. But for the man or woman of faith, the naked voice of God is enough. Secondly, a promise to claim in verse 9. By faith he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. A promise then to claim. Abraham gave up what he had to seek what he didn't have. God promised him, you remember, a place of his own and a people of his own, land and a family, a son. And I guess when he heard that promise from God, he must have said, come on, Lord, bring it on. I'm looking forward to that place and my son. But if you know the story of Abraham, you'll know that he was kept waiting for year after year after year. We tend to read the story of this man's life without gaps, but there were very large delays in Abraham's life, and yet, at every stage, he waited and obeyed. When he arrived in Canaan, there was no welcome committee at the borders with a brass band playing and the, and the Lord Mayor handing over the freedom of the territory to him. But it was still the land of promise. God told Abraham, remember, to look up at the night stars. And he promised him that his family would be as many as those stars. And yet the months 
and the years went by, 13 of those years before Isaac was born. In the life of faith, we learn that blessing doesn't automatically or inevitably follow obedience. For faith lives with promises and delays. But it also lives in tents. Abraham never settled down, the text says. He traveled lightly. The only piece of land he owned was a burial plot for his wife and family. The only thing he, he held on to tightly was the promise of God's word. That's the life of faith. We travel lightly. We hold lightly onto this world. Why did Abraham live that way? Because, says verse 10, he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. There's the third lesson from the life of Abraham. He had a command to obey, a promise to claim, but he also had a city to anticipate. That's the genius of this man and the reason for his life. Abraham realized that Canaan wasn't the end of the journey. The land was part of a promise pointing beyond itself to something greater and better. That city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. You see, what inspired this man, what drove him forward to live the life of faith with promises and delays, what inspired him was the glory of heaven. That's the truth that shapes the man or woman of faith. The kingdom of God is the one which motivates us. So we see ourselves as, as pioneers. We're not settlers here. We're committed to a journey with God. And our identity as men and women of faith is, is not wrapped up in the trinkets and prizes and successes of this world. We are pilgrims. We are traveling to the music of the future. And so the life of faith was lived, says the author, by Abraham and by Isaac and by Jacob, for their portraits are also in the Hall of Fame, and by Joseph and Moses, and then at verse 29, we get a surprising story of faith. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. This is the first group photograph, if you like, in Hebrews 11. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. All the other portraits in the gallery to this point are of individuals who walk the life of faith. But this is a portrait of a generation, the Exodus generation, which left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Again, if you know the background, you'll know that this was a moment of national crisis when a million people or more stood trapped the waters of the Red Sea in front of them and, and mountains and desert either side of them and the Egyptian army charging towards them. There was no way out. There was no way to go. But Moses said to them, jump, move forward. And they did. And there was no splash, and no one stepped in a puddle, and no one had to wear Wellington boots. They walked to freedom on dry land. That's what this picture in Hebrews 11:29 commemorates, the collective response of faith to a significant moment. And sometimes such moments exist in history when a nation has to make a decision, or when, as we face here at LBC, a congregation has to respond to a call of God to act with courage and vision and trust to step forward in faith. Once more, the picture in Hebrews 11 doesn't cover all the material of those chapters in the book of Exodus. So let me just fill in the background from Exodus chapter 13 and 14. Listen to this from verse 10 of chapter 
chapter 14. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Do you find, do you find this extraordinary? Because that picture in Exodus 14 is hardly a picture of faith. And yet they are in the gallery of faith in Hebrews 11. The, the picture in Exodus 14 that I've just read is the opposite of faith. It's a picture of unbelief. And so in Hebrews 11, isn't the curator of the gallery amazingly gracious? God places this unbelieving people in his hall of fame in spite of this episode. And if you know your Old Testament narrative, then you will know that that's not the last time that the people of Israel demonstrate a distinct lack of faith. In fact, the prevailing characteristic of this generation was their unbelief. After they crossed the Red Sea and en route to Canaan and the land God had promised them, you'll know that they wandered in the desert because they didn't trust God. A journey which had taken just a, a, a few days, in fact, takes 40 years. And during those 40 years, this generation complained and grumbled so much that in the end, only two of them made it into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. The rest died along the way. And yet, gloriously, none of that failure is remembered and recorded there in Hebrews 11. This generation, the group photograph, is in the gallery of faith because for one defining moment, which was to shape the destiny of a nation and a world, they said, we believe God's word to us. We will trust God. Your life and mine, it can be a catalogue of failures, of, of defeats, of setbacks and missed opportunities. But then along comes a moment, a day, a time to do the right thing. Our backs to the wall. It looks like a dead end, but by the grace of God, we step up. We move forward. We jump not a blind leap of faith, but a jump into the light of God's promise that he will hold us and take us forward. How did this ragtag bunch of awkward, faithless people end up, therefore, in the faith hall of fame? It all began on the night to remember, Passover. In the last of, te, uh, of God's ten judgment plagues to force Pharaoh's hand so that he would let the people go, the angel of death moved through the land of Egypt. And as he traveled, he passed over the homes of those who'd obeyed God's command. And they'd smeared the door frames of their houses with the blood of a sacrificed lamb. In every home in Egypt, there was a death that night, either the death of an animal or the death of a firstborn son. And during that evening, the children of Israel gathered as families for a meal. They ate the meal hurriedly, standing up and dressed for a journey. For the Passover was their ticket to freedom. Before the lamb died, they could not go. After the lamb died, they could not stay. And those who'd rested safely under the blood were bound to walk with God, committed to a life of pilgrimage and faith and so it happened remember pharaoh could take no more and he called moses in and said your god wins go so passover was the beginning of the journey but only the start it was a decisive break with the past the call to leave egypt was a call to embrace their future but strange as it sounds in spite of everything that they'd been through the slavery and oppression, when it came to it, the people of Israel were reluctant to do so, to go. 
Isn't that instructive? It took one night to get Israel out of Egypt, but it takes 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And when you think about your own life of faith, your own spiritual journey, isn't that the way it often is? The decisive event of faith is our commitment to and trust in Christ, the one whose death in our place for our sins releases us from judgment into the liberty of God's forgiven people. We are out of Egypt, but Egypt isn't out of us. There are life issues and sin patterns and behaviors, and they may take time to deal with, years in some cases. The past still holds on to the coattails of the future. And so we become aware of a painful process of change. And sometimes we don't get it right. And sometimes, like the generation of Israel here, we, we look back and say, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And when that happens, we need to keep saying to ourselves, I've passed the point of no return. There's no going back to the old life. I belong to Christ. I've been bought with a price. I must go forward in faith. But that doesn't necessarily make things easier. In fact, Israel discovered that when you walk with God, he sometimes takes you the long way around. As the author of the Exodus account says when Pharaoh let the people go God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country though that was shorter for God said if they face war they might change their minds and return to Egypt so God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea it wasn't in other words the most direct route out of Egypt that God took his people in fact it was the longest so the question is raised, why take a million people with all their possessions that way? Well, the narrative gives a clue. So God led the people around by the desert road. God led the people. Now, that may not have felt so reassuring to these pilgrim refugees as they looked at the map, as they got out the compass and calculated the route. But God takes a long-term view. And his people have things to learn before they're ready for the next great test of faith. In your life, you may well wonder, why doesn't God get on with it? Where are we heading, Lord? Why are we going the long way around? In the life of faith, there's always a process which we have to trust. God is leading. Follow him. He's not lost his way. In fact, for Israel, God provided the most unusual guidance. It came in that pillar of cloud and fire, a kind of ancient sat-nav system, I, I guess. It was more than a navigation tool, though. It was a protective shield. We're not led today, of course, by pillars of cloud and fire, but we enjoy two resources for the journey of faith, the living and active spirit of God and the living and active word of God. The point is, my friends, God knows where he's going, and how he's going to get us there. Even when from our perspective, he takes the long way around and he makes us wait, there are always good reasons. Some of us, I, I know in my own heart and life, some of us want to take shortcuts to spiritual maturity, but there are none. Some of us want to realize our dreams too early. But the timing of God is always perfect. With God and pilgrimage, often the meaning is in the waiting. God is doing something, preparing us, getting us ready. And while we may want to pick our blessings too soon, God wants us to have them when they're ripe. And for things to be ready in this generation that's eventually in the Hall of Fame, God had to bring them to a place where the only thing they could do was trust him. No props to lean on, no support structures, nobody and nothing but God. And that is the point to which God will sometimes bring each and every one of us. When we can't do anything, when we can't go anywhere, when we simply have to trust and step forward. And that's the point, you see, that the 
children of Israel reach. They come to that point where Moses answers the people, don't be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. What do we learn about the, the life of faith there? We learn this, that when we live the life of faith, the battle belongs to God. It says Moses, the Lord will fight for you. And so that issue that right now in your life scares you, how am I going to deal with it, you think? The challenge in your life which keeps on beating you time and again, maybe the overwhelming fear of the future. How do we deal with, with these things? We need to hear God's word to us, addressing our fears. These are his battles, and he will fight for us. Because in the end, they all belong to God. They're part of his strategy in my life and yours. And sometimes we have more to fear from our fears than we do from our problems. So over that issue in your life tonight, hear God's word. It belongs to him. The battle is his. And when we forget God's promises, we can start to imagine all kinds of worst case scenarios. Doubts build up, don't they? Fears increase. We can even start to complain like the Israelites. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, than die in the desert. But when we travel with God, we learn that faith stands firm. That's what Moses tells this generation. Stand firm and you will see the, the, the deliverance of the Lord. Don't be afraid. There is a stillness about faith, which is not weakness, but strength. For faith is resting in God. We recognize that this is his battle and he will win it. Be still, says the psalmist, and know that I am God. Now, be still in the context of Psalm 46 means put down your weapons. Stop fighting. Stop fighting the circumstances. Stop trying to solve problems your own way. This is my battle, says the Lord. Trust me. Be still. Sometimes the truth is that we have to do that for year after year, to stand firm and let God do it his way. Let God work it out. And that therefore means that we may become weary with our struggle, our constant battle, and attracted to other options rather than trusting God, other ways of meeting our needs or solving our problems. But of course, all that highlights perhaps the greatest lesson of, of this generation, Sometimes God leads us into situations where our only option is to trust him. When we, when we live the life of faith, we learn that God is our only hope. This was crunch time for Israel. They were boxed in. There was no way out unless God made a way. And when we roll out the application to our lives today, what I think we begin to see is that what's at stake in these critical moments of our pilgrimage is a conviction that God can make a new beginning out of a dead end. That the God of Passover is also the God of the Red Sea. He's the God of resurrection and new beginnings. For there was no alternative for this generation but a divine intervention. The author of the great escape had to be God. So when I realize that the battle is the Lord's and that I need to rest in God as my only hope, look at what happens in the life of faith. There comes a moment when the command to stand still, which addresses my emotions, my fears, becomes a command to move on, and that addresses my will. I have to do something. In fact, I would go further and say this. If God has told you to do something, to move forward in faith, then nothing else will happen in your life until you do that. For doing it is the outworking of faith. And that's the final lesson which the group portrait 
in the Hebrews 11 gallery gives us. Obedience is the key. You see, Moses tells them to stand still and wait. And then he tells them, follow. So God says to Moses, raise your hand, your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water. And then tell my people to go. They cried out to Moses, and Moses had cried out to God, and God said, tell the Israelites to move on. That may sound a bit unusual, but there comes a time when we have to quit praying and start doing. Now, of course, we always need to keep on praying, but there comes a moment in your life and mine, in the life of faith, when God has told us to move, and it's time we did. You see, if God has told you to obey him in some area of your life and you haven't yet, then nothing will happen until you do. We can't expect God to honor his promise if we don't honor his word to us. But when we honor his word, when we do trust God, when the command to stand still becomes the command to move on and we obey, there's a wonderful promise attached. God will be with us. For the Lord will not ask us to do what he will not enable us to do. So if tonight God is asking you to trust him in an area where you are so scared of doing so, where you feel utterly powerless to help yourself, to come to terms with a situation that defeats you time and time again, then let me me encourage you. God will equip you. He will empower you. He will defend and keep you as you step out in faith. My friends, there comes a time in the life of faith when we must act. When we have to stop analyzing and wondering and just do it. That's the call of this chapter in Hebrews. The call to a life of faith that trusts God. For the journey is marked by a series of apparent dead ends in which we have to trust God for tomorrow, for a new life, for a new future. The past is behind us. The future beckons us. God calls us to hear his word and obey. And faith hears the promise of God to us in Jesus and says, yes, yes, I will move in the presence and in the power of God. That's the life of faith, the life of trusting God's word to us in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, if there are folks here this evening who have heard your word to them and they know what they need to do, please give them courage to step up, to step forward, to trust you. Lord, if if we're here tonight battling with fears about our lives, overwhelmed by insecurities, may we be still and know that you are God. And as we face as a church in our generation this call to trust you for the future with this exciting new project, Lord, we pray that we will step forward and believe you and see you meeting our needs and providing for all our resources. Lord, you've called us to live the life of faith as we trust in Jesus. And we pray that we'll do that for your glory. Amen.